Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Gill. I'm a member of Arnhem Anderson, uh, and I, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Jonathan Murphy as our speaker today. The last, but certainly not the least, uh, in the new crop of Arnett Manderson members who've recently called um, to take part in the Better the Devil You Know uh, series of seminars. Uh, I, I'm interested in Jonathan because over the last year or so, I've had the great pleasure of working very closely with him uh, as his principal devil master. Uh, and that time I've got to know him very well. Uh, I, I could highly recommend him as a very hard worker and a quick study. Uh, and it's been a great pleasure for me working with him. I'm not sure it's been the same the other way around. I think he particularly wasn't quite expecting the amount of uh, arcane questions of uh, valuation law that he's unfortunately had to consider. But uh, it, anyway, it's good for it's good for the soul. Um, Jonathan um, is someone who is so fascinated by law that he, he has two degrees in law. He has, first of all, a BA in law from the University of the West of Scotland, and then he has a an LLB from the University of Edinburgh. Um, he, before uh, starting Devilling, he practiced as a solicitor, primarily dealing with personal injury uh, work uh, and appearing regularly in sheriff courts. So that's his background. Um, he is going to be speaking, as to, speaking to us today on the subject, uh, the endlessly fascinating subject of the judicial review procedure. And I think this is a very uh, appropriate time for this topic because come September, it will be five years since what I still call the new procedures uh, in the Court of Session for Judicial Review came in. And there are a number of uh, thorny procedural points, uh, which now with the benefit of five, uh, five years um, uh, of the system operating, um, you know, we're beginning to have some clear answers on questions like uh, per permission to test for permission, timing for permission, uh, time bar, et cetera. So I, I know Jonathan has uh, thought carefully about all these points and uh, we'll be covering them. And um, really, uh, I think we can look forward to uh, learning something from, from his talk. I will, uh, just to explain procedure, I will now um, go on silent and um, I'll let Jonathan uh, uh, speak. If you have questions, I think you can put them in the chat. And what we will do is we will uh, try and uh, cover them at the end of Jonathan's talk. I'll come back on uh, and, um, um, you know, as I say, any questions, just either uh, as we go along, uh, I'll sweep them up or um, save them for the end. OK, well, thank you very much. And uh, Jonathan, I'm you. Thank you very much, Brian. So we'll just quickly try and share the screen. Hopefully this works. Um, so thanks very much, Brian, um, for the uh, introduction. And I, uh, just as a disclaimer, I thoroughly enjoyed valuation for rating. Um, uh, it did indeed uh, nourish and uh, empower the soul. Um, ladies and gentlemen, today the purpose of this talk is to discuss um, the procedural pitfalls that are inherent in the judicial review uh, procedure. In 2015, the procedure changed as a result of uh, a review by the um, Scottish Civil Courts Review. Uh, the result of that review was the insertion um, of sections 27A to 27D into the Court of Session Act 1988 uh, by virtue of the Courts Reform Scotland Act uh, 2014. The procedure arises from the Court of Session Act 1988 the rules of the Court of Session and um, the practice note number three of 2017. Um, as Brian alluded to, um, this is quite a hot topic. The area continues to develop and new decisions uh, come out with frightening regularity, um, so much so that the talk that I'm giving you uh, today um, was completely different yesterday because uh, yet again, uh, another decision came out. Um, so if anything appears disjointed, I do apologise, that is the reason. Um, a little bit of a disclaimer, um, sadly, uh, due to time constraints, um, I cannot cover um, the issue of uh, standing or sufficient interest, um, nor can I cover the second appeals test or the um, compulsory reference to the upper tribunal. Um, sufficient interest and the second appeals test I will mention in passing. Um, but um, 
I won't really cover the compulsory reference, but you do need to be aware that it is mandatory. It's an element of the form of a petition uh, and it does require to be addressed in every petition. So I'm just flagging that up there. Um, just because of the time constraints, I can't cover it. What I do hope to cover, uh, time permitting, um, is the requirement to exhaust alternative remedies, the three month time limit, um, which includes a discussion on the grounds giving rise to the petition, uh, the computation of time, and the discretionary power of the court to extend the time limit. We should also cover the test for permission, which includes the requirement for standing and the test of real prospect of success uh, and also the second appeals test. But as I mentioned, uh, the sufficient interest in second appeals test is really just mentioned briefly. I also intend to cover whether amendment is competent before permission has been granted. This is actually quite a contentious area, um, so that'll be a good discussion. Um, we'll also discuss entitlement to an oral permission hearing. Um, and finally, um, we'll discuss appeals under section uh, 27D um, of the Court of Session Act uh, 1988. Um, in particular, there being no discretion uh, to allow an appeal lodged late um, and that the appeal is essentially another permission hearing. <clears throat> as an application to the supervisory jurisdiction of the Court of Session is seen as a remedy of last resort, the Court um, may not exercise its jurisdiction to grant remedies sought where there is an effective remedy um, an effective alternative remedy available to the particular petitioner. Um, whether or not it's an effective remedy um, will depend on the particular circumstances of the case. And I've noted, and you'll see on the screen, I've noted a couple of cases here that support this point. Um, but in the interest of time, I, I'm afraid I just cannot go through each and every one of them. But that's what the general rule is. So it's important when considering relying upon the supervisory jurisdiction of the court to be aware that if there are other forms of effective redress available, um, then the court may not exercise its jurisdiction. In Rule 58, three, uh, paragraph one of the rules of the Court of Session, um, it makes clear that a petition um, may not be lodged if that application can be made by review or appeal. So technically, you can't lodge the petition if there exists an appeal or review. However, in practice, the petitions department won't know whether or not there exists grounds um, of appeal or review. However, this will be identified either at the permission hearing or at a substantive hearing. However, it is important to note that the Rule 58.3 is narrower than the common law position as the rule is restricted to appeal or review. Um, as Lord Calloway stated in the case of MIAB, um, at paragraph 73, although, although the rules of court session 58.3 provides only that judicial review is not available if the application could be made by an appeal or review under any statute, the general rule regarding the competency of seeking review or at least of granting the remedy sought is rather wider. It is that the court may decline to exercise its, ju its supervisory jurisdiction if it appears that the petitioner has not exhausted a statutory remedy, provided that there are no exceptional circumstances, such as uh, the alternative being an, an effective one. Now this was recently applied by Lord Doherty in the case of BBC petitioners. Um, and the citations on the screen for you just now. In that case, the petitioner sought to review the refusal of a sheriff um, to provide reasons for the issuing of an interim order under section four of the Contempt of Court Act 1981. Lord Doherty, after quoting the court in MIEB, held uh, that at paragraph 38, um, quote, the real issue which requires to be determined is whether the requirements for a section four subsection two order are met 
an application for revocation would provide the petitioners with an opportunity to question whether the requirements of section 4 subsection 2 are satisfied and to have the order revoked if not. The process would not be one of appeal from or review of the first respondent's decision. Rather, the court would require to hear and determine the application on its merits. The important point to take from this is to ensure that there is no alternative remedy available to you um, before raising the petition. Um, it is not enough that there is no appeal or review as the court may nonetheless refuse to grant an order if there is some other method that would provide you an effective remedy. If you are responding to a petition and you believe there is an alternative remedy, then you should furnish the court with sufficient information to determine whether that remedy is effective, um, both um, by productions and pleadings. Um, such a defect worked against the respondent in the case of Smart's uh, guardian against Fife Council, which I referred to in the previous slide. <clears throat> Applications for judicial review are subject to a time limit of three months, beginning with the date on which grounds giving rise to the, the application first arise, and that's set out in section 27A, subsection 1. A of the 1988 Act. Although there is under paragraph uh, B a discretionary power to extend that period having regard to all the circumstances of the case. It's important to be aware of the mand mandatory terms of Rule 58.3 which requires that when an extension of time, uh, an extension of the time limit is sought then that must be stated in the petition. Because the time limit runs from the date on which grounds giving rise to the petition first arose, it's important for the petitioner really early on um, to give consideration as to when this occurred. Um, it could be far earlier than expected, and a number of the reported decisions, uh, that is exactly what happens. The court finds that the, the date um, on which the grounds arose um, was further back in time than the petitioner had um, expected. So if there is the possibility of it being at an earlier date, then my own recommendation would do, be to proceed on the basis uh, of that earlier date. If that is passed, um, then be sure to include in the petition itself a fallback position um, if it is an earlier date, um, and then uh, ensure that you make clear that an extension is sought in terms of the, the legislation and set out your reasons why um, in the whole circumstances of the case, it would be equitable for the court to do so. Otherwise, um, you, you really do run the risk of your petition being dismissed at the permission state, uh, stage. Now, because one of the underlying reasons for having a time limit is to provide certainty for the validity of administrative decisions, it has been held that the time starts to run from the date the decision is made rather than the date it is received um, and I'm referring to Lord Eric's opinion in Odebajo against the Secretary of State for the Home Department at paragraph 18. Um, Lord Eric uh, did uh, however say that any delay in receiving um, the decision um, can be taken into account um, when considering whether or not <coughs> excuse me, to extend the time limit. Do note, however, that this decision uh, on this point um, is subject to an appeal, although no decision has yet been made. In terms of um, the grounds giving rise to the application, um, unfortunately, determining when the clock actually starts running is not always straightforward. Um, it really depends on the circumstances of the case and also the particular ground um, that is being challenged. For example, in the case of Patterson against the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission, uh, the petition, sorry, the petitioner uh, lodged her petition on the 25th of April, 2017. 
on the basis that the time ran from the 1st of February 2017, um, following what, in her view, were um, uh, fresh representations made back in December 2016. Uh, the court disagreed with the petitioner. Um, Lady Clark um, stated at paragraph 21 that, uh, and I'll, I'll quote this, in my opinion, the statutory wording is perfectly plain. It is necessary to identify the date on which the grounds giving rise to the application first arise. In some cases, this identification might cause some difficulty, but not in this case. I consider that the grounds underpinning the petition relate to the decision by the respondent to reach a decision based on material not seen in full by the petitioner. So what we see here is the court focusing in on the ground of the petitioner's challenge. Um, the, the judge then states that it is clear from the factual history that the petitioner became aware that the respondent relied on undisclosed material in a decision on the 31st of May 2016. And then, and at that point, it was open um, for the petitioner to raise the petition, which he didn't. In that, in that case, the court actually refused to extend the time limit because the petition disclosed no good reason um, uh, to justify months of delay. This, uh, my view, underlines the need um, to act promptly when you suspect that you have grounds for judicial review. It is important to note, however, that the court will have regard to the whole circumstances of the case and not just the early state that the petition uh, could be raised when deciding whether to allow an extension under Section 27A. An example of this is the decision of uh, Energy Contour UK Limited. Um, this is an interesting case involving the Ministry of Defence's seismic array um, used to detect nuclear detonations um, and a wind farm. Um, the Ministry of Defence's policy, which was being challenged, occurred back in 2005 um, and the petition was lodged on the 31st of December 2019. Lord Tyre considered each of the different time periods um, within the petition um, that were involved and concluded that it was equitable to extend the time, the three month time period to the date the petition was lodged. He took account of the importance of the issue the lack of prejudice to the Ministry of Defence and the attempts by the pursuer to resolve matters out with litigation. Paragraph 25, um, his opinion is stated as, quote, exercise of the discretion must, according to the authorities and the wording of section 27A subsection 1B itself, take account of the whole circumstances and not merely the earliest date when the petitioner could if it had chosen to reasonably have begun its litigation. <clears throat> now we'll move on to the actual calculating of the three month time period. Now, for the purposes of section 27A, a month is defined as a calendar month, and this is set out uh, as per section 25.1 and schedule one uh, to the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010. This actually has some consequence um, because a calendar month means that you, it does not matter how long a month is. A month can be 28 days, a month can be 31 days. But what you're required to do is simply to count the months forward. Now I've got here noted uh, the corresponding date rule. In the House of Lords decision of Dodds and Walker, Lord Diplock, um, held that when calculating a period of time measured in calendar months, the corresponding date rule would apply. And what that means is you would take the same date in the final month as the initial date. Um, this allows you to ignore variation in the length of a month. So, for example, if it was a three-month time limit uh, and the date started on the 5th of January, you would then it would be the 5th of April. Um, so it's the same date, you just carry forward a month. However, um, when you read the decision, it becomes apparent that in order for that rule to work, 
um, the first day cannot be factored in. Um, and, and this was picked up by the inner house case, um, in the case of uh, Pasiti Jones against O'Brien. That although the corresponding date rule, um, that this was the inner house saying, that although the corresponding date rule um, represents the law in Scotland too, it uh, operated by ignoring the first date of the calculation, which means it can't apply if the legislation requires you to include the first date. If it does, then what you have to do is deduct one day at the end of your calculation. Otherwise, you're going to have an extra day at the end. Um, so, for example, if it was the 5th of January again, instead of being the 5th of April, it would be the 4th of April. Um, and whether or not uh, it's a corresponding date rule or whether or not you need to uh, deduct one is uh, depending on the legislation itself. So for the purposes of section 27A, the wording of the provision means that you have to include the date on which grounds giving rise to the application first arose. That means when you are calculating ahead three calendar months, um, you, you do so as per the corresponding date rule, but then you need to deduct a, a day at the end. Um, and it's just a nice, easy method of quickly working out um, when your case is time barred, if you're up against it in, uh, in a matter of days. Now we'll go on to the requirement for permission. Section 27B, uh, subsection one, prevents petitions from proceeding unless permission has been granted. Under subsection two, the court requires to be satisfied that the petitioner has A, sufficient interest, uh, and B, the application has a real prospect of success. Um, in that section, um, the second appeals test also crops up. Um, but as mentioned previously, I won't be discussing sufficient interest or the appeals test in much detail. What I have provided for you though on the screen is the two cases that I think you need to have a look at um, first and foremost. So for sufficient interest, um, it's the speeches of Hope and uh, Lords Hope and Reed and Acts of General. And for the second appeal test, have a look at um, Lord Hope again in the case of Iba. In terms of the real prospect of success test, um, it means what it says. You must demonstrate a real prospect of success. The Lord President and Whiteman against the Advocate General um, provided some clarity on the issue and he sets out in paragraph nine um, what the test is. Um, there's not enough space in the screen, um, so I haven't put it on, but I would recommend that you go and uh, read it. Um, it's effectively a higher hurdle than the previous test that was set out in the case of EY, which was manifestly without substance. And the purpose of the new test is designed to sift out um, unmeritous cases, but it should not prevent what may appear to be a weak case um, from being argued in full. It must be more than arguability or stateability, as to quote Lord Boyd in CF China Petitioner, um, <laughs> the ingenuity of counsel knows no bounds. For present purposes, you need to be aware that the decision on permission requires rapid decision making, normally on the papers and as a preliminary issue. Um, again, you see um, the decision of Whiteman and also the decision in MIAB um, against the Secretary of State for the Home Department at paragraph uh, 66. Um, the court should not be engaged in determining the merits of the application. Um, although it may um, form a preliminary review on the merits in order to determine whether the test under section 27B is met. Uh, and this is set out in the um, fairly recent decision um, of the inner house um, in PA uh, Pakistan against the Secretary of State for the Home Department, the paragraph 30, and I've got the citation there, I'd recommend everyone to go and have a read at that. Um, this means that care 
um, should be taken to ensure that the grounds of challenge are clear and precise, that the relevant facts are set out clearly, and you address in the petition why permission should be granted, um, having regard to those. It's also important to note that Rule 58.3.4a requires you to lodge all relevant documents with the petition. This aids the decision maker in determining uh, whether or not to grant permission. So if you are instructing counsel, the letter of instruction should be clear as to what the ground of challenge is. It should set out all the relevant facts and provide all the relevant documents. Um, and as we're going to discuss in a minute, um, you may not be allowed to amend your petition until after per permission is granted. So it's really best to ensure all the relevant information and the arguments are in the petition from the very from the very start, nice and clear, uh, so that it makes the decision maker's job much easier. Uh, and if you make their job easier, um, you're more likely um, than uh, it would otherwise be to get permission. Now, moving on to um, a bit of a contentious problem um, that's still before the courts and, and there's no set of authority. Uh, and unfortunately, the question as to whether or not you can amend before um, permission has been granted, um, there's no easy answer to the question because there is conflicting authority from the outer house and there is no binding authority on the subject from the inner house. Um, before we get into a discussion on the topic, my own view at this point is to err on the side of caution and to work on the assumption that you cannot amend before the granting of permission. That way, you'll be more focused um, in the early stages to ensure your pleadings um, are as tight as they can be. Um, for example, um, the error on the part of the respondent that you rely on is absolutely clear from the averments and it means that the court can just look at it quickly and understand what your case is about. Amendments, in the, the cases that I've read so far, the amendments appear to be in response, uh, certainly a number of them uh, in relation to answers lodged by respondents, but that really shouldn't be necessary. Um, any slight errors or clarifications um, can and should be adjusted uh, in the adjustment period that would follow. Now, as you'll see on the screen, there are three decisions um, which discuss the point. Um, they are um, RA, Iraq, uh, Wang and Havrilla. Um, and the issue is essentially focused on section 27B, subsection one of the 1988 Act, which states that, quote, no proceedings may be taken unless the court has granted permission for the application to proceed. Now, in the case of Ari Iraq, it was submitted that proceedings for the purposes of section 27B1 of the 1988 Act included the amendment procedure. It was therefore um, not competent, um, uh, the amendment procedure rather was not competent as section 27B1 precludes proceedings being taken until after permission had been granted. Now, in that case, Lord Boyd held at paragraph eight that um, Rule 24.1, um, paragraph two of the Rules of Court, allowed amendment at any time before final judgment, and that refusal of permission was not a final decision. Therefore, in his opinion, the minute of amendment at the stage of review was competent. Um, and so, Lord Boyd held that it was competent um, to amend the petition before um, permission had been granted. Now, the second decision is that of Lady Stacey and Wang. The petitioner referred to RA um, in submissions, uh, and oh, rather, however, um, Lady Stacey at paragraph 18 agreed that section 27 was plain in itself. Uh, and, and I'll just quote her ladyship. Um, it introduces a new step in judicial review. That step is described as a requirement for permission before anything happens in the petition that has been lodged. 
she then distinguishes RA on the basis that Lord Boyd was concerned with amendment at the uh, request of review stage. And so essentially Wang held that um, uh, it is not competent to amend um, before the granting of permission. And the final case in this uh, saga is um, the decision of Lady Wolf and her brother. Um, her ladyship made obter comments at paragraph 11, rejecting the view that no proceedings um, precluded amendment. Uh, she stated, quote, I would not have been inclined to accept the respondent's submission on this point. A minute of amendment is a step of process uh, under reference to Rule 1.3 of the Court of Session Rules. Proceedings, while not defined in the rules, is suggestive of more substantive procedure. A minute of amendment prepared by one party need not necessarily involve a hearing or any substantive response by the other party. If, for example, it would be used to correct an obvious error or to clarify an ambiguity. The other party might concede the substance of the proposed minute of amendment. In order to preserve the court's ability to apply its procedures flexibly and fairly, I would not be inclined to construe proceedings in a manner which would preclude this. And so um, Lady Wolf uh, effectively held obiter that it was possible to amend a petition before um, permission has been granted. Now, there has been some commentary on the issue and by both the editors of the annotations of the rules of court and also the court of session practice book um, to the effect that Wang is um, incorrectly decided. But my own view is until we have a binding decision on the point, there's still going to be some doubt because RA um, decided that on the basis of effectively a legal syllogism, uh, the fact that um, it's competent to amend up until final decree, we have not had a final decree, therefore it's competent to amend. Um, whereas the real decision, the real issue in the case is whether or not the word proceedings in the legislation encompasses amendment procedure, because if it does, that's an end of it, and it's not competent to amend. Um, so I, I do think um, this needs to go to the inner house um, to provide some clarity on this point. Um, so in my view, at present, um, the safest course would be to be alert that amendment may not be competent, and therefore try not to rely on it at the permission stage. Um, moving on to uh, a part of the talk today that had to change rapidly um, because uh, the case that I'll be referring to um, came out yesterday. Um, so if something looks a bit off of the formatting, I do apologise. Um, the new procedure under the 1988 Act is designed to sift out petitions that uh, do not have real prospects of success without expending any court resources. It is important to realise that there is no entitlement to an oral hearing. You cannot then rely on the opportunity to address the court orally and to clear up any irregularities, any deficiencies in your case. That means that parties should draft their petitions and answers in such a way as to put their best case forward straight away. This ties in with what I was saying earlier. You should be clearing your grounds of challenge. Um, you should allow for the possibility of the court deciding a different date um, on which the grounds arose um, because the court can and it does um, refuse permission without any oral hearing. Section 27b subsection 5 is clear that the Lord Ordinary can refuse permission without an oral hearing. Um, practice note 3 2017 at paragraph 12, uh, 12 states that the Lord Ordinary will ordinarily order an oral hearing of considering, uh, considering refusing permission. However, um, the courts have accepted uh, that there will be times when uh, an oral hearing will provide absolutely no benefit. Um, and um, you should have a look at uh, Lord Doherty's opinion in the uh, case of um, Dinsmore, which is um, on the screen for you at paragraph 19. Uh, following a refusal, 
you can request a review at an oral hearing under section 27C. Uh, subsection two, um, which states, quote, the person making the application may request a review of the decision at an oral hearing. However, it is only a request for a review at an oral hearing. The Lord Ordinary is not obliged to order one. And this was made um, clear in the Inner House decision of uh, Pryor and others against the Scottish ministers, um, which uh, came out um, yesterday. Um, it's an opinion of the Inner House, the decisions given by the Lord President, um, and at paragraph 47, um, Lord President Calloway states, uh, quote, in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of section 27C of the 1988 Act, where the Lord Ordinary refuses an application, in whole or in part, without an oral hearing, the applicant may request a review of that decision at an oral hearing. The applicant does not have a right to have a review at an oral hearing. The right is only to request such a review. So if there is such a refusal of the request, then uh, that is the end of the petition. You don't have an appeal under section 27D, subsection one and two, because that applies only after an oral hearing. And there is no entitlement to reclaim because of the terms of section 27C, subsection six. Again, the court in prior makes this clear at paragraph 49, uh, uh, and I'll quote it again, if the request for a review at an oral hearing is refused, there is no right of appeal or scope for a reclaiming motion. That refusal brings an end to the application for permission process. So the point that I want everyone to take away is that you need to ensure that your petition is as strong as it can be before you lodge it. Um, and, and be as clear as you can on the ground of challenge, anticipate arguments uh, from the respondent and try to address them in the, in the petition if you can, such as the use of an ESTO position. Um, you really cannot rely on having an oral hearing. Moving on to the uh, seven day uh, time limit to appeal. An, an appeal to the inner house under section 27D subsection two uh, must be made within the period of seven days beginning with the day on which the court makes its decision. Rule 5810 provides that such an appeal is by way of reclaiming motion and reclaiming motions are covered in chapter 38 of the Rules of Court. Now, under section 27D, there is no mention of a dispensing power to allow an appeal um, under that section out of time, whereas uh, such a power is included uh, in relation to the time limit for the application itself, which is three months. However, there is a discretionary power under the rule of court, rule 3810, to allow a reclaiming motion to be received out of time if caused by some mistake or an advertence. The question then, or the question is then, can the court's dispensing power under the rules of court allow an appeal under section 27D uh, out of time? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Lady Clark, in the case of Beggs against the Scottish Ministers, um, stated at paragraph 13, quote, that rule 3810 is designed to relieve a party of a failure to comply with the rules relating to reclaiming days. I am unable to interpret this as giving power to the court to relieve a party from the consequences of a failure to comply with the seven day period set out, not in the rules, but in the statutory provisions relating to appeal. She went on to conclude that it is not competent for the court to exercise powers in respect of this late application to appeal, and in particular, that rule of court 3810 is not applicable. This means that 
if you miss the date of lodging your appeal by just one day, you've missed the opportunity to have uh, your permission um, for judicial review. Uh, you're, you're, you're going to miss the opportunity to have that reviewed by the inner house. And at that point, your petition is at an end. So it's important when you get your decision that you decide quickly whether you wish to appeal to the inner house um, under the Act, and if you do, to act promptly. That may be difficult with um, some clients, uh, maybe difficult for agents and counsel just now, given that um, it's still during lockdown, um, but you do have a very strict time limit here, um, and it really is in everyone's interest to have um, the availability of the inner house to decide the permission for you. Whilst we're discussing an appeal under Section 27D, I think it is important to highlight, uh, again, another recent decision of the Inner House on the extent of such an appeal. In PA Pakistan against the Secretary of State for the Home Department, um, the Lord President, delivering the opinion of the court, stated at paragraph 32 that although it follows the same procedure as a reclaiming motion, um, an appeal under that section is not a reclaiming motion. There is no basis to restrict the scope of the appeal to an error of law on the part of a Lord Ordinary because the statute does not do so. In paragraph 33, he then explains that section 27D, subsection 3, requires the inner house to simply consider whether to grant permission to proceed. The court um, will decide for itself whether or not there is a real prospect of success giving due respect to the opinion of the Lord Ordinary, but it does not need to find an error, whether in law uh, or in fact. Um, and uh, Lord President um, mentioned in passing that this approach of deciding permission anew effectively provides a further safeguard uh, for petitioners to have their, uh, the question of permission decided. And that is the end um, of my talk. I think that's actually doing quite good time. Um, see if Brian's still. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks very much, Jonathan. That was a, a extremely uh, clear and thoughtful discussion. I thought it was striking how many of the decisions that you're referring to. You have a 2020. Uh, often CSIH neutral citation. So it's clear that things are still, uh, even five years on, st still are uh, developing. Um, I'd like to ask if any uh, participants uh, have a question um, that they like to submit by the Q&A. And ha hello, Bilal. Um, we see your question, well, a couple of questions. <laughs> Three, uh, but first of all, Bilal's first question, Jonathan, is how you calculate the time limit with respect to ongoing failures. Um, do you need to point back to the most substantive outcome of that failure, i.e. E missing out on a benefit or not gaining a particular advantage, or could you just use the day of the lodging the petition and say it's ongoing? I think, um, Jonathan, you may remember this better than I, but there, there, is there recent uh, English um, decisions on that question? Um, yes, there was a, a decision of the Court of Appeal, um, if memory serves me correctly, and the question was the date at which you had standing. Um, but uh, that decision wouldn't be binding in Scotland. Um, my own view would be um, you would have to take the decision when it first arose. Um, the, there was a case regarding um, the uh, telephone calls between prisoners, and it's, I've actually cited it in the, the PowerPoint uh, production. Um, and the court said that that was not a continuing act. The consequences of it were continuing, but the decision itself was a one-time decision and you could pinpoint it with clarity. Um, so I, I think you really need to um, look back and, and try and work out um, when it is, um, just to be safe. And then if it is sometime in the past, to ensure that you are seeking the equitable jurisdiction, uh, the equitable extension of the time limit, just to be safe. 
you don't want to get into the, posi the position when you are arguing that it's a continual matter and the coach just disagrees with you straight away. Um, you're out, um, uh, you're out on a boat without a paddle at that point. <laughs> Did you finish that? You answered uh, it? I think so, yeah. Sorry, I think you were saying right off there. Okay, thanks. Okay, then Bill's second question is about remits, and you be fair to you, Jonathan, you rather skated over that uh, remit to the upper yeah. tribunal, but possibly because, as Bal points out, they're rare in practice, and he's asking what sort of decisions could or should be remitted. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I, you can also see a question about the procedure about whether you still need to go through the court of session to get to the tribunal or, or whether you can go directly to the tribunal? Um, so, uh, Bilal, on the first point, um, effectively, if it is a procedural decision of the first-tier first tribunal and it relates to a reserved matter, um, the court must exercise um, the reference uh, to the upper tribunal if it is on a... Uh, um, if it's not in a reserve matter, uh, then it's a discretion decision. Um, and we'll try to see what the second part of that question was. Um, I'm not sure, but actually, on that second point, whether or not you need to go uh, direct to the court of session. Um, uh, Brian, do you know the answer to that? I think I think you do. Yeah. You do? Sorry, I don't know. Um, I, I've never actually thought of that. Um, but yeah, uh, so thanks, Bilal. I've, I've just uh, learned something. And then Bilal's uh, third question is, um, what proceedings, uh, again, and the, that quite the question of, uh, comes out with decisions on amendment, but does proceedings include, for example, an application for an interim order? And as he points out, the, the procedure current practice is that interim orders can be obtained before the permission stage. Yeah, Bilal, you're absolutely spot on on that. Um, <clears throat> It is one of the, the, the arguments that have been advanced because you can apply for interim orders. Um, you can even apply to have the period of notice um, reduced. And that doesn't sit well with the idea that that is proceedings. Um, it, it's one of the arguments um, on one side of the fence. Uh, and really, it's going to, I think, take the inner house um, just to sort us all out and make it perfectly clear for us. But uh, a perfect a perfect example of one of the arguments against it. And Jonathan, I think the reason why it's, as you say, that is possible is because that's expressly permitted in the in the rule of court. Yes, that, that yeah, it's in the rule of court, um, yeah. So the argument is that anything that's not expressly permitted must be proceedings that, that is uh, prohibited. That that would be the argument in favour of the Yes, the um, and that was the argument that was advanced um, by counsel for the respondent and uh, Ari, Okay, thanks. Moving on, Laura. Hi, Laura. Um, Laura McDonald has a question, not a question really, but a comment on recent arguments by respondents that the SPSO route should be exhausted first. What do you think, Jonathan? Is that right? Um, and do you, I don't, I myself don't know anything about the um, the inner house decision that Laura's referring to. Don't know if you do. Um, I don't think so. I'm just sort of the, the screen keeps moving with uh, new comments. <laughs> um, Um, I don't know, Laura. Um, it, it's encouraging to see that um, there's going to be a, an our house decision on it. Um, as we said, I'll be back at the start of this area. Despite being five years old, it's still evolving. Um, probably to do with ingenuity of council <laughs> and agents um, uh, trying to find ways um, uh, around decisions. Um, but I'm afraid I just don't know, Laura, is the answer. Yeah, we've been an anonymous attendee. Uh, similarly, on the question of amendment petitions before uh, permission being granted, and is there potentially, um, you know, she's asking, is there potentially not a difficulty more generally with the current rule in that petition proceedings are commenced when the petition is lodged and the decision on permission comes at a later date? So the way the rules are currently structured, the decision on permission is surely itself always coming after proceedings have commenced. Yes, I mean, that is um, one of the points against the idea um, that amendment is um, not possible. Um, I would agree with you. Uh, there, does, there does appear to be an inconsistency. Um, 
but I do think that the court needs to focus in and decide one way or another what proceedings actually means in the legislation. It's just a bit of clarity because I don't think there's a right or wrong answer at the moment. Both sides have good and strong points. Um, yeah, hence why I say it's um, a contentious topic. <laughs> I think just to point out, Laura, again, helpfully is um, commenting that you know, she's got experience of uh, two judges, Lord Pentland and Lady Poole, uh, both allowing amendments pre-permission recently. And in her experience, she's, she's uh, um, saying that, that that really depends on the facts and circumstances. When something new has been raised in the answers, then the petitioners have been able to argue for amendment on the basis that the court has to determine per permission on the up-to-date facts. And of course, we do, there is always the, the problem of um, the sister legal aid lasting a long time and the position can, can have changed significantly in the interim. So th thank you for that, Laura. Yeah, um, and then I think that the outstanding question we then have is from James McFarlane. Thanks, James. Hello. Um, and what he's saying is reminding us that in Whiteman, the division stated it may be the case ought to proceed simply by way of an action for declaratory rather than a petition for uh, JR. And if that was right, then GR would have been incompetent because of an alternative remedy available, and and because, of course, the sheriff court now has uh, uh, is, is, has competence for such an action, um, could it have gone in, into the sheriff court? What do you think about that, um, James? I agree with you, um, and I hope you read the case that came out yesterday from Dinner House. Um, Dinner House again made clear that. Um, the supervisory jurisdiction of the court would not extend to um, over than a, a decree of the court um, and the, the proper action is by um, raising it as an ordinary action. Um, so uh, I think that's now beyond doubt. Um, but it's important to bear in mind that the new judicial review procedure allows for the transfer in and out of the judicial review and ordinary cause procedure for this very reason. Um, so I don't know if there's any reported decisions on it, um, but I'm sure it's going to happen more often in the future. And then Alex Roberts. Hi, Alex. Thanks for your question. Um, Alex is asking, um, what's your advice, Jonathan, when the respondent offers to concede before a full hearing and re-examine the decision? Um, I would... <laughs> Um, if it's going to be um, a, a true re-examination of the decision, such that um, it will be decided anew, and you can actually get a, a decision you want, um, then I see no harm in taking it. Um, but you could um, ask the court to um, uh, hold off having the substantive hearing for a period of time to see if that decision can be worked out um, on a, a quick basis. Um, but that's going to depend on the circumstances of the case, Alex. Thanks. Uh, I, I don't think we have any more questions from participants at the moment. Um, oh no, Bilal's back. Hi, Bilal. Hello. Um, I think he's referring to the English case law about rolling JRs where new decisions have been made. But there's nothing in Scotland. So what is the basis, he's asking, if the respondent changes a decision unilaterally? Um, usually at that point, um, <clears throat> you no longer have um, grounds for your review. If if the decision is now in your favour after you've raised it, um, the court won't grant you what you ask for. Um, in terms of um, the English cases, um, anything to do with English judicial review cases on procedural elements, um, I really, really would treat with caution. Um, and there's uh, I thought it from Lord um, Hope on that. Um, the grounds of review are similar. Um, Everything else is taken um, slightly different turns um, this way and that way. Um, but um, sorry, I can't be of any more help there, Bilal, but thank you for the question. Okay, well, I, I think if we have no more questions, that's probably time to wrap things up. Uh, it's, it's very uh, telling that we've, uh, unlike I think any of the previous <laughs> Better the Devil You Know sessions, uh, where questions have been few and far between, I think. Uh, it's quite telling that we've had so many questions from participants. Uh, your talk, Jonathan, I think that shows the, the relevance and continuing interest of the subject. Um, and uh, I think, Jonathan, your talk has has, has helped uh, advance a lot of the issues. 
I'm particularly grateful for the corresponding date rule, which means that I'll no longer have to <laughs> fingers. Um, a, a quick, easy way to do it is very helpful. Uh, thank you, John, for your talk. Um, thank you all to um, participating and, and listening, and as I say, um, uh, contributing questions. We're very happy to have had so many people join us uh, uh, in Arnhem Anderson for, the, for this talk. Um, we hope you found it helpful. And uh, on that basis, I'll just say thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you so much, Brian. Cheers, everyone.